Hello everyone, welcome back to Fraud on Telly. In today's video, we're going to be starting a new series, Critical Role Unraveled, where I break down an episode or a scene from Critical Role and then explain how we as the viewers or D&D players or dungeon masters can take something from it and learn from it in our own games. Today, we're going to be talking about specifically dream sequences and how Matt Mercer uses them throughout Critical Role. As always, if you enjoy the video or learn something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Go check out some of our other Critical Role and Legends of Vox Machina content. Let's get into it. So if you've watched Critical Role for any extended period of time, you've probably noticed that Matt Mercer has a tendency to use dream sequences. Matt's quite fond of using cryptic dreams to reveal plot information, have players communicate with gods or other such beings, or drop nuggets of potential plot and things like that. This is something really iconic to Matt's DM style, something so much so that the players in cast themselves both dread and love these moments. You can see them freak out anytime it's at nighttime time and Matt seems to hint that a dream sequence is coming. You can see the players' faces just light up, specifically Travis. Now we're a spoiled for choice when it comes to choosing a dream sequence to analyze throughout all three campaigns of Critical Role. It seems like almost every character throughout every campaign has it had at least one dream sequence. I don't think that's true, but it might be for all we know. Today we're going to be breaking down one of my favorite dream sequences, specifically Ford's first dream sequence from Campaign 2, Episode 5, The Open Road. Our episode begins as the Mighty Nine are heading north on the Amber Road, leaving the city of Trostenwald having just finished the Devil Toad arc. As the party camps on the road, Matt has the party do their usual nighttime watches. Relatively nothing of interest really happens, kind of lulling the party into this false sense of security. Matt loves to do this. You'll see him do this all the time. Just as it seems they're going to have a relatively uneventful night's rest, Matt calmly asks everyone in the room to leave the table except for Ford. If you don't believe me when I say the cast both love and dread these moments, just look at the way they freak out and the reactions on their faces as soon as Matt says this. They all know that something spicy is about to happen. Marisha even looks at Travis, saying, look, it's your turn now. Matt, through some amazing exposition as always, narrates that Ford feels trapped in some never-ending dark abyss. He says he's still stuck for what feels like an eternity when suddenly the temperature around him begins to drop dramatically. Ford begins to try to move in the space around him, but he finds that his movements are slow and sluggish. There's some kind of resistance stopping him from moving as he normally would. It's just then he realizes that it's water that is the resistance to his movement, and he is currently in some kind of shadowy underwater abyss. The searing pain of suffocation begins to build in Ford's lungs as suddenly he's taken by the current. The shadow of some gargantuan creature begins moving around him. He can see it in the shadows. Ford is then claimed by the current, unable to hold his lungs any longer, the briny salt water filling it close to bursting. As he opens his eyes though, he realizes that he can breathe. He is then horrified to see that the giant creature has begun to curl around him, this dark shadow amassing. In Matt's words, it looks like a massive noose closing in around you. Suddenly, a massive light engulfs Ford as he is suspended in this water. The light is a massive yellow eyeball, one of the creature before him. In his mind, Ford hears a voice mutter a few words, the first being watching. Ford's confused. He asks what the creature is. The creature repeats the word watching. He then asks, are you watching me? To which the creature replies, potential. The voice rumbles out, learn, grow provoke, consume. Ford says he doesn't understand what the creature wants, to which it responds reward. The eye suddenly closes, Ford again is left alone in the darkness. As the darkness engulfs him and he seems like he's going to suffocate, his eyes shoot open, wide awake, and he begins coughing up salt water. Okay, so obviously Matt is an expositional wizard. I highly recommend going and watching the sequence that I just described because he does way better of a job of conveying this horrific feeling of drowning better than anyone. But there's way more to it than just the exposition. Let's start with the first thing that Matt does, having the players leave the table. Matt's done this numerous times throughout the show, but I think it's very interesting how sometimes he doesn't have players leave the table when he does a dream sequence, and other times he does. He does this for a number of reasons, one primarily being specifically backstory reasons and wanting to hide that backstory as this was very early in the campaign. He also does this for plenty of other reasons as well. You see, in this instance, the party recently hit level 3, or being a warlock selected the Path of the Blade, becoming a Hexblade warlock. 
This entire dream sequence is because that Ford is a warlock and they happen to be level 3 and he picked his pact. The sequence itself is basically having Ford unlock his warlock powers while introducing his patron actually to him, but it sets the tone for the relationship between him and his patron going forward. Natalie is the master of the warlock patron relationship. I'm pretty sure I'm going to make a whole video dedicated to that coming up in the future. So Matt has the players leave the table in order to keep Ford's backstory secret, but as well, it makes the dream feel even more powerful. You couldn't tell from the exposition, Matt is super well versed in horror. The way he describes Ford being alone and suddenly realize that he is underwater and drowning is absolutely terrifying. The first time you watch it for a brief instant, you don't realize you're underwater and he conveys this idea of drowning unexpectedly extremely well. Drowning being a natural fear in humans, job well done. Meanwhile, a massive underwater creature coils around Ford. Yeah, this is some straight nightmare fuel stuff. This one-on-one -on -one interaction really ups the stake and the buy-in from the player. If Travis wasn't immersed already, surely he was immersed now. I can only imagine how intimidating it must be being one-on-one -on -one with a DM like Matt Mercer, but wow does it build some amazing roleplay. As well, it draws the audience in and the player investment. Player investment, in my opinion, is one of the most important things for a well-run enjoyable D&D game with good RP. In my opinion, this is what makes Critical Role so good, besides the fact that they're all voice actors and good friends, they're all extremely invested, like they're all the way in. In addition, the dream sequence serves as a massive teaser and reveal to Ford about his patron as well as the audience. It's funny watching this scene back after seeing the entirety of the campaign, because the amount of information and lore that Matt drops here as teasers is way more than I ever thought it was when I first watched the scene years ago. As well as we stated earlier, it really sets the tone between the relationship between Ford and Ukatoa. Every warlock patron relationship is different. While they're all give and take, there is a nature to their relationship as well. It's very obvious in this one, Matt wanted to set up a distinct hierarchy here. Ukatoa is this world-ending serpent. By taking Ford and putting him in this vulnerable place one-on-one, -on -one, even if it is within a dream, it makes this known. Ford will forever be scared of Ukatoa. In fact, Ford overcoming his fear of Ukatoa is kind of a whole arc within itself. While Ukatoa gives Ford power, it views itself as very much the master in this relationship, as can be seen by Ford's feeling of utter hopelessness in this dream. As well, Matt loves to be cryptic and secretive as a DM. He loves long-term storytelling, often setting the seeds for broad plot reveals hundreds of episodes before they happen. These dream sequences are just one way he loves to do that, as viewers of Campaign 3 surely know all about right now. As well, Matt as a DM consistently puts his players in uncomfortable and challenging situations. Now, what do I mean by this? Let's take this Ford dream sequence again. Midway through, when you think this is going to be a Matt Mercer cutscene, Ukatoa looks to Ford, saying the word watching. It then patiently waits for him to respond. Travis has no idea what's going on here, what he should do, what he should say. You can tell he's racking his brain to try to figure out, okay, what do I do here? Am I gonna die? It's this taking a player unexpectedly out of their comfort zone that I love what Matt does really making them sink or swim, no pun intended. It's a very similar thing to what he does when his players perform resurrection acts. Instead of just casting the spell, bingo bingo bongo, the players revived, Matt likes to have players offer something, whether it is verbal or physical, oftentimes a mixture of both. The players oftentimes would struggle coming up with something meaningful, especially early on in the campaign. It's this kind of putting out of your comfort zone that I think makes for really good roleplay, and has obviously produced some of the most amazing events in Critical Role. Overall, I love Matt's use of the dream sequence in D&D. And the thing is that any DM can do this. Obviously, Matt is the best in the business at exposition, but anyone with a bit of time and a little bit of notes can write something almost as good. I really hate a lot of DMs afraid to use notes or to pre-write out scripts, but Matt does this as well. Oftentimes, you can see him glancing down at his notes to get reminders or to read specifically awesome piece of paper that he wrote specifically for this instance. Players as well, if this is something that you're interested in, whether it's because you're a cleric that wants to speak with your god or you are a warlock that wants to communicate with your patron, tell your DM. I found that many of players oftentimes want something out of their D&D campaign, but for whatever reason, they're too afraid to ask their DM or to tell their DM, hey, this is a thing that I'd like you to, you to implement. And if you're a DM, it's really hard to 
provide something for a player if you never know that they want it. Throughout Critical Role, Matt has really perfected his use of the dream sequence. He uses it in a variety of ways, as we've already said. I really think my favorite, though, is when he hints at these potential big plot reveals, a lot of time interlacing character backstory with ultimately what is a big bad evil guy or a bigger arc than what they originally thought it was. Nowadays, Matt even goes so far as to bait players into dream sequences. You see him do this all the time. He does this as well with combat, where oftentimes he'll make the players think that something's gonna happen only just to debate them and say ah it was just nothing all along keeps players on their toes let me know in the comments down below what is your favorite critical role dream sequence there's a lot to choose from but i'm very curious to see recently i've been going back and watching a bunch of them because i am in the process of dming a potential campaign and i'd like to better verse myself in how to use dream sequences to kind of set up long-term storytelling as always if you enjoyed the video make sure you like comment and subscribe go check out some of our other critical role content like our backstory breakdown as well as our other Legend of Vox Machina content. As always, stay safe out there. I'll see you in the next video. Peace, love, Adu.